today as we come to the table. It is amazing how many things we have built into us religiously and traditionally that we don't even realize. And in the South, we've got quite a few of them. You know, I could go down a list of some of them, but I'll just name just one. I know for me, I'll, I'll give you a couple. For me personally, I know that when I got saved, I had a real struggle with certain kinds of music. I've shared that with you guys because I came out of the clubs playing music for the wrong purpose in the wrong way. So when I would hear certain kinds of music, I'd think, well, that can't be of God. That can't be of God. So I'd search the scriptures to find out. And there's nothing, God doesn't forbid any kind of music in the scripture at all. It's literally, there's, it's, it's just amoral. God doesn't mention what kind of music is good or bad. God says, worship me. Use music to worship me. And I begin to realize, you know what? It doesn't matter what kind of music it is, just worship the Lord. Have you ever wondered what kind of music God likes? Would he listen to rap and heavy metal? Or does he only approve of hymns and worship music? I'm sure all of us come from various Christian traditions that have certain rules about different issues. They may not be wrong, but they're also not based on anything in the Bible. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table the Daily Bible Study Program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark teaches you that as a Christian, you don't have to be bound by specific traditions that have no basis in the Bible. You can be free from rules and traditions that you follow to feel spiritual or to be right with God. There's nothing you can do to make God love you or approve of you any more than He already does. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, as he continues his message, No Turning Back. The moral law is, this is God's standard, this is holiness, this is what is right, and we need to follow the Word of God morally, even though we don't have to live under it, legally. And so... Uh, again, the morals are, are, are something that apply to our life. Even in the law, you'll find moral things from the law, but the legal side has been fulfilled. Even the Sabbath has been fulfilled in the legal side of things. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 17 says this, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements, there's the legal side, the 613, the requirements that was against us, he wiped it out, he's saying it's gone, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it, that is Jesus, out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So it was done at that point. It is finished, as the Lord said. And notice this, having disarmed principalities and powers, that is the demonic realm, he disarmed them through this victory, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. And here's the verse, verse 16, that really drives it home. So, and you can put dot, 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 pause. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival, that would be the feast, or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is Christ. That is everything God gave us in the law and the feast days, the festivals. It was only a shadow or a picture of the things to come in Jesus. And he's fulfilled them. And so now we can learn from them and we can see beautiful truths in them, but it's not something we're to try to follow. You know, again, it's, it's easier than you think to be uh, trapped under the law. Uh, the Sabbath, again, is one of those. Like I said, you see, Jesus, the Bible says, and we'll address this first. Jesus says that the Sabbath rest is him. He is our Sabbath rest. Rather, the Bible says that. Uh, Hebrews 4, verses 8 through 10 says this. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did his. That is, if you've entered the rest of Jesus, you've entered into your Sabbath rest, and the context is Sabbath rest because that's when God rested from his works. 
So what he's saying is, knowing Jesus, that's your Sabbath. People say, do you observe the Sabbath? Are you keeping the Sabbath? No, but the Sabbath sure is keeping me. Because Jesus is my Sabbath, and he keeps me, and he holds me. Um, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Paul, again, just frustrated with them, you know, saying, you know, you're doing these weak and beggarly things again. Does nothing stick, you know, and, 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 and how, why do I have to keep going over this? It is amazing how many things we have built into us religiously and traditionally that we don't even realize. And in the South, we've got quite a few of them. You know, I could go down a list of some of them, but I'll just name just one. I know for me, I'll, I'll give you a couple. For me personally, I know that when I got saved, I had a real struggle with certain kinds of music. I've shared that with you guys because I came out of the clubs playing music for the wrong purpose in the wrong way. So when I would hear certain kinds of music, I'd think, well, that can't be of God. That can't be of God. So I'd search the scriptures to find out. And there's nothing, God doesn't forbid any kind of music in the scripture at all. It's literally, there's, it's, it's just amoral. God doesn't mention what kind of music is good or bad. God says, worship me. Use music to worship me. And I begin to realize, you know what? It doesn't matter what kind of music it is, just worship the Lord. Yet how many people today, I can't go in that church, they have a drum set, right? You ever heard people say things like that? They play guitars in that church. Look, when, when you read about the instruments that David built, guess what we would call them in his day? If we lived back then, if, if he lived today and he made those instruments, we would call them guitars. That's all they were. And they used it in worship all the time. And this is where many fellowships, where they don't have worship or don't have music there or whatever, they, they, they look at the word of God wrong, that it rules they're set free. Listen, I'll give you another one. This is, this, Paul was basically shocking them, and the Jews especially, saying, you don't need to do this. Don't follow these traditions. Lay it all down, and I'll give you another one here in the South, and that is when you come to church, take your hat off. Oh, blasphemy! Where's that in the Bible? It's a Southern tradition. Out west, they wear hats during worship. No big deal. Nothing in the Bible. Bible didn't say anything about it. But right now, some of you are struggling. I'll find where it says you can't have to take your hat off and we're going to do whatever, right? And yet, even the thought that I say that, see, when Paul was writing this to them, they were having some of the same reactions you were. That would be, <gasps> right? Not so much the Galatians, but the Jews. And when Paul wrote them in Hebrews and said this kind of stuff, <gasps> how dare you, Right? And yet it's amazing how entrenched it is in our life. And it takes years and years and Bible study to be free of these things. And so some of you right now, you're bound up by tradition from the South. And God is challenging you saying, lay that tradition down. I'm not saying not follow your convictions. I'm not saying, and certainly you don't want to breach your conscience. But it's very healthy for a believer to jump in the word of God and say, what does God's word really say about this? I hear certain people say you can't have guitars and drums. Where's that in the Bible? Well, it's not there, but I just know it's wrong. Okay. I say people see this and say that. Well, where is that in the Bible? I don't know, but it's got to be wrong. Well, it's not. And so much better to walk in freedom than it is to walk in bondage. And so, again, especially now, speaking of bondage, this is something the Galatians should have understood. The Galatians were, many of them were slaves at this time. And many of them had been former slaves, set free. There was a mixture, again, remember, Rome had some 60 million slaves and we're not talking about slaves like we think of today. This was all cultures, all backgrounds, all colors were slaves. Because if you lost in battle and war, you became a slave. If you had debt, you became a slave. And you were owned by some family or by some this or by some that. And so they knew that. The Galatians knew. And Paul's saying, why would you go back to being that? Why do you want to be a slave again when you've been set, set free from this? Again, it would be like fighting in the Civil War. Imagine if the Civil War, give me a picture for a moment. Again, the Civil War trying to set the slaves free in America. And again, it was, and they came from all, it was down south, people fought to set them free, up north, people fought to set them free. And all colors came together of people and fought against slavery, okay? Imagine after that battle, think of how many people lost family members. Listen, there were families that split down the middle and fought each other in the Civil War. Think how many people they lost just emotionally. Maybe that wasn't, you know, some they lost physically in battle, some they lost emotionally. There was blood, there was sweat, there was tears, but it was the right thing to do. And it was a battle, and it was worth fighting, and people were set free in that battle. Now imagine, everybody set free from, from the Civil War here in America, and all of a sudden those that are set free say, you know what, thanks for setting us free, but we don't want to be free. We want to go back and, and continue to be slaves. Paul, they would have understood this in Rome. Paul would say, you guys are slaves in Rome. You know what this is like. Many of you are slaves right now as I'm writing you this letter. You've been set free by Jesus Christ. You know what it would be like. What if you were set free from your slavery? Would you want to go back and serve the rest of your life as a slave? Or would you like to be free? Well, we'd love to be free, Paul. Okay, you are free in Jesus. You may not be physically because the Romans have you under their bondage. But in Jesus, you're spiritually free. And, and you want to go back to that? See, this is where when you see people running back to the law, this is exactly what they're trying to do. It's a burden. And I think about Paul, it would be like Paul saying, 
I went to battle for you. I fought in that spiritual civil war to set you free. I fought the Jews. I fought the Galatians. I fought everyone. And after all that fighting and all that battle that I did, losing friends, losing family, all that I expended into you to do that, now you want to just throw it all away and go right back? He says, it's not just you that's suffering. It's me, your spiritual father. I'm suffering because of all that I've poured into you. And notice he says here, he goes, and I'm afraid for you, lest you've labored in vain. Look at verse 12. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You've not injured me at all. Again, what is he saying here? Paul's making a couple of statements. One, a plea and an appeal. The other's a complimentary statement. His first plea or appeal is that this, he being a Jew, lived like a Gentile among them. He says, I became like you. I didn't try to come there and live in the law or under the law with you guys. I lived exactly the way that you guys live, as a Gentile. And I did that because I'm free, and I wanted you to know you're free as Gentiles. You don't have to come under the law. It's been left behind. I, I, I'm living as though I'd never had it. He says, now you, you're trying to live even though you didn't have it before. Now you're trying to let people talk you into coming under the law. He says, don't, don't become like, I became like you, so you become like me. Be free from this. And then he compliments them as well, saying that even as he intends them no harm to them, neither did they intend him harm. As a matter of fact, uh, they had, they'd been a huge blessing to Paul while Paul was there. And Paul's going to go into more detail about that. In verse 13, he says, You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So they really loved him and took him in as the Lord himself. He says, what then was the blessing that you enjoyed? There must have been something that you were pleased about me. Why, for I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now, there's a lot in these few verses. Again, Paul is saying, you know, I, the reason I preached the gospel to you is because I was there and I was sick. It would appear that the reason Paul preached the gospel to them was because he found himself stranded in their region due to some type of illness. And he points, he says, when this happened to me, you guys didn't reject me. You didn't cast me out. You received me even as you would have received the Lord. And he says, I was blessed by that. Why, if you received me so well then, are you rejecting me now? Now, he'll get to the answer to that in just a moment or question them further on that in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to bring up a point here. And this again shows the complete error and fallacy of the health and wealth and faith gospel. See, the health and wealth gospel says that God wants us always healthy and wealthy and always, you know, never, never sick or any kind of problems or whatever. What Paul is saying is, and he says in another place, look, God himself gave me a thorn. The scripture says that God gave him. Paul says, God gave me my thorn in the flesh. Now, whether this was Paul's thorn in the flesh that he received when he got sick here or not, we don't know. Some think that Paul got malaria. There was an eye disease in this region called ophthalmalia, which again would uh, give a great infection to your eyes. It was a very common eye disease in that region, which is why some believe maybe that was it. You'd get an infection, it was very painful, and even pus running from the eyes. So a very kind of gruesome looking thing, you know, that would happen to you there. And, and, and I, we don't know what it was for sure that happened to Paul or whether this was even his thorn in the flesh, but the bottom line is, is what he's saying is, whatever this was that happened that made Paul have to stay there, he said, you would have plucked your own eyes out and given them to me. So that gives it more emphasis that maybe indeed it was something to do with Paul's eyes because it says when he mentions plucking their eyes out, it's emphasized in the Greek, which gives a little bit more credence to the theory uh, that you would do this. And he says, you know what? God used this. This very illness is why I was here. And I noticed this. If Paul had not been stricken in an illness, they wouldn't have heard the gospel in Galatia. Think about that. Now, you can go back and forth whether God caused it or whether God allowed it. It doesn't matter. The point is, God uses physical illness for his glory. God gave Paul a physical illness to keep him humble and used him in that. God gave Job physical illnesses to use him as a witness and a testimony. And yes, God healed Job later. God didn't heal Paul. From all indications, God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, and Paul died with that thorn in the flesh. And for those who would say he lacked faith, nonsense. God uses this. Now, what's my point? Number one, the health and wealth gospel is totally debunked by the scriptures alone. But maybe some of you right now are going through a time of illness and you're wondering, what have I done wrong? You may not have done anything wrong. You may be doing everything right. It may be that God is allowing this illness in your life because he wants you to reach the doctor you're going to see or the nurse you're going to run into or the person that you're going to talk to in some situation that has the same thing that you have going on or whatever the case might be, God will use that. And God does use that. And so Paul says, it was because of this thing that happened in my life that God used me to preach the gospel to you guys. 
And he says here, by the end of this, he says, so what has happened? What was the blessing you enjoyed? If, if you treated me like, like the Lord himself, if you treated me like an angel of God, verse 15, what was the blessing? You had to be blessed by something. And he says, I bear witness, you'd have given me your own eyes if you could have. He says, but, but now what's happened? Look at this. He says, if that was good, what have I done to make you my enemy? Look at verse 16. He now tells us what he did. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Guys, how many times have you seen this? Where you tell someone the truth. Maybe you have a friend and they're living in a way that you know is gonna destroy their life. Maybe you went to a brother or a sister and you share with them, say, look, what you're doing here is gonna destroy you. Why are you doing this? Why are you living in sin? You know what the Bible says. And we usually get you know, different things. Sometimes it'll be kind of maybe a, a, you know, I just don't, right now, don't really want to deal with that or whatever. Sometimes it's a don't judge me, brother. Sometimes it's a whatever the case might be. But the Bible says that, again, if our brother's in sin, we're to go to our brother and to lovingly address that. And Paul says, I came to you and I said, look, you're living in sin. You're going back to the law. I'm going to address this. I love you. I can't just sit back and ignore it. You're, you're putting your spiritual life in danger here. And so I'm going to address this, and again, because I've addressed it, because I tell you the truth, now I'm your enemy. Again, probably most everyone in this room has experienced that at once in their life. I know it was a, a once or twice in their life. I know as a pastor, I've run into it numerous times over the years. Well, there'll be someone, there's some situation, and you realize, I've got to address this situation, especially as a pastor. And you go to them, and maybe you've known them for years. Maybe you've, you've loved them for years. You've invested in them. You've done all this stuff like Paul had invested in the Galatians. Years of heart, years of love, years of blood, sweat, and tears. And you go to them and say, look, I know this is not going to maybe be received the best, but I've got to talk to you about this. And you talk to it, and they storm off. And from that point, they no longer not only don't love you, they treat you like you're the devil. Paul's saying, why are you doing that? I, I spoke to you the truth because I love you. I didn't tell you the truth because I hate you. I didn't tell you the truth because I want to, uh, you know, just get you upset. I know it's going to destroy you. And listen, if you've got somebody that loves you enough to come to you and confront some situation in your life that you know is wrong, realize it's because they love you. Realize that. Maybe you've got someone right now, you've got a friend that you're estranged from because you address the situation and they got mad. Oh, I can't believe it. I'm not going to be your friend anymore. And they storm off or whatever the case might be. Maybe you're here from another church. Maybe, maybe you were at another church. One of the elders came up to you and he addressed some situation. He said something about it. Something had to be dealt with. Somebody else in the church, well, I can't believe that. How dare they? And you leave that church, you go to another church. Here's the problem. You go with you. I'm leaving that church behind. You did, but you went with you. And oftentimes it's your issue in your heart that's got to be dealt with. And so what do you do? You find yourself sitting in Calvary Chapel because they hurt your feelings down over there. There's still something in your heart that's not settled. It's churning. And you know what needs to be settled. Listen, if that's you this morning, and you're jumping and running to churches and you ran because your pastor or the elder or some friend addressed some issue, deal with it this morning. Be honest about it. Say, God, I, I didn't like that. It hurt my feelings. But there's some truth to it. If there's truth to it, receive it. And I'm to do the same thing as a pastor. You know, sometimes you'll get a letter, you get an email, somebody says something. And I remember a pastor say years ago, you know, somebody said, do you receive that? What do you do when somebody sends you a letter that, that's painful or they say something that hurts or whatever? Ask yourself, who's it from? Is it from Jonathan, who was the, the friend of David and loved him? Or is it from Korah, who's leading a rebellion out in the wilderness with Moses? If Jonathan, look, if Korah sends you a letter and you know this is a troublemaker, ignore it. Throw it in the trash. They're a troublemaker. But if Jonathan, the one that you know loves you, the one that's poured his life out for you, the one that has shared his heart, and his, his, if Jonathan comes to you and goes, hey, we got to talk about this, receive it. The Bible says that the wounds of a friend are faithful. Receive it. And it might be that some of us in here need to repent this morning. Ask God's forgiveness of a wrong heart toward a friend or a past church that we ran from or whatever the case might be. And, and maybe, you know what? maybe the guys at the other church didn't do everything exactly right. Maybe they didn't. But here's the question. Number one, they're just human. Maybe they didn't handle it right. But was it true? Was it true? If so, Deal with it. Settle it this morning. And Paul's saying, look, I've come. I've told you the truth because I love you. And yes, am I speaking with passion? Paul, again, uh, gets convicted because he's dealing with them harshly. And Paul begins to kind of, you know, say, he starts to soften it up in the last couple of chapters because he knows he's been laying it on thick. You know, it's interesting, he lit Paul's heart. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he hit him hard. He hit him hard. He said, come on, guys, boom, boom, boom. There's a guy living in sin. Kick him out of the church, Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Kick him out of the church. And then after Paul writes the letter, I just know a pastor's heart. Paul's going, oh, man, I was too harsh. 
I shouldn't have done that. I should have said it this way. I should have approached it that way. And Paul writes 2 Corinthians. And if you know a pastor's heart, you can read it. Paul goes, okay, I know that was a little bit tough. I want to commend you all. Way to go, team. You did a great job. And when that guy comes back, take him back and love him. And, all. and you can hear the heart. He's like saying, ah. Why? Because he's human. But why did Paul address it so firmly in 1 Corinthians? Because he loved them. And why is Paul addressing it so firmly here in Galatians? Because he loves them. And if God is addressing you firmly or someone you know is addressed, Lord, is it true? What do I need to do? And let God deal with it. Again, listen, let's don't leave this place without settling the accounts. Again, no turning back. Number one, we can't turn back to the law. We can't turn back to what we had before. But right now, if God is dealing with you in an area in your heart, here's why I want to do this. But they deserve to not be forgiven. They deserve. Listen, I want you to be free. You need to be free. You're in bondage. And if you're carrying that with you, you're bound up by that. They're, they're sleeping fine. You're the one laying up in bed going, oh, be free. Take it to the Lord right now and say, God, heal my heart. Matter of fact, let's just end today by doing that. Let's just lay out whatever's going on. If we have issues in our heart, if we find ourselves on the run, if maybe there's something we know we need to get right with a brother or sister and there's something we're dealing with, let us deal with it, but let's not leave this place without dealing with it. Let's pray right now. Let's just end that way today. Father, I just, I sense your spirit again, Lord, like you did in first service, just working again for this restoration of hearts. And Lord, it's so... Um, it's so easy, Lord, to set up a fence. That's part of who we are. And we look at Paul in Galatia. And there was Paul in Galatia, Lord, and he was loving them and pouring out his heart for them. And Paul was addressing issues. And because Paul addressed the issues, after all he had done for them and loved them, they hated him and they turned on him. And he said, why are you doing this? It's for your own good. God, maybe there's somebody in here this morning who's had that kind of situation in their life whether it's a church they came from where they were hurt by leadership or whether it's a friend that said something to them they wish hadn't been said, whatever the case might be, Lord, was there any truth to it? Is there an issue that needs to be settled first with you and then with that friend? God, if any of us are in that place this morning, let us humble ourselves. Lay our pride down. Number one, that we might be right with you. Number two, that we might be free and not bound up in bitterness our anger, but also that we might, by your grace, be restored to our brother or sister that the enemy is successfully divided by spiritual battle. Lord, we know there are casualties of war. We recognize that. But we also know that you bind up the enemy and you bind up the wounds and you bring healing. And I pray, Lord, that as you hear the hearts of brokenness and confession this morning, that the wounds would be bound by your spirit, that the salve of heaven would heal and bring restoration. God, do a work among your people. Time is so short. We need to be about the Father's business. Lord, it's not a time to be fighting each other. It's a time, Lord, to be working together for the kingdom. Help us, Lord. And we just thank you again for the work of your spirit this morning and all that you've done. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And just like that, another episode of Come to the Table is ending. But you don't have to wait until next time to listen to more great Bible stories. You can access this series plus much more at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say about this subject and so much more. The book of Galatians has so many practical applications to daily life inside and outside the church today. When you hear your pastor talking about legalism, he's teaching from this text. When there's a political unbalance between church and state, the Church of Galatia is the biblical foothold for how God's church should conduct itself under such pressure. Never let it be said that the lessons in the Bible don't apply to the modern day. They are as real now as they were then. Do you live in the Knoxville area? If so, we invite you to join Pastor Mark and our church family at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community and through this radio outreach. There's always a seat for you. Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11.15, Saturday night at 6, or Wednesday night at 7. Can't make it in person? No worries. You can join us online. We stream our services through the Way Media app. 
that you can download from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. You can scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church info too. Pastor Mark has much more to share from the book of Galatians. So we hope you can join us next time on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.